Okay. I think I miss in-person meetings. <laughs> I guess we do miss all the in-person meetings. <laughs> okay, so I think we're ready to go. We have um, about 70 particip participants already logged in. Um, and again, we had a great showing of RSVP for this session with over 160 um, individuals registered um, for this session. So I want to welcome everybody to our session today, um, which is discrimination in hospital medicine, perspectives and experiences. And I would like to introduce our panelists today. But before I do so, a little Zoom reminder um, that these sessions, even though we're holding them virtually, we trust that this is actually a virtual safe space in which our participants as well as panelists are sharing um, information that at times makes us vulnerable, at times makes us relive trauma that we may have had. So I trust that um, as participants, we will protect this space and we'll, we'll be respectful um and um treat it as such um i thank you if i will thank you if you actually keep um your microphones muted um so we can actually hear the participants without any background noise however um if throughout them speaking throughout the session you have questions i encourage you to type those questions in the chat room which will be um, when you click under participants, um, you will see the participant list come up as well as the chat room. We will be monitoring those questions and we will save them for the end of the session. So again, feel free to, to ask questions um, in that way. If your question is specific to one of our panelists, please um, indicate um, which panelist you would like to, um, you know, to have answer this question. We hope that um, you, know, you engage in really fruitful conversations today. Again, um, as in the first session, I would like to thank um, Dr. Mark Geraci for agreeing to have this diversity, equity, inclusion summer series back in the spring. And I thank Dr. Naga Chalasani for his continued support on um, this topic throughout uh, this summer. I know that this has been a little bit of a difficult time that we're living in, not only through our socio-political environment, but even within the school. So um, I thank you all for engaging in, um, in these type of conversations and embracing inclusive excellence as one of the values of the Department of Medicine. So thank you again. So with that said, I am going to introduce the panelists. The first one is Dr. Ariba Kara. Dr. Kara, a little wave, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> Dr. Kara was born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan, where she attended medical school at the Aga Khan University. She completed internal medicine residency training at IU and has been a hospitalist working at IUH Methodist since 2003. She completed master's training in clinical research and was part of the inaugural 
cohort of Aspire trainees. She serves as the key clinician scholar for hospitalists and is the first hospitalist to be promoted to the rank of associate professor. She co-chairs the Society of Hospital Medicine's um, special interest group on diversity and inclusion and her research interests include hospitalists, models of care, cognitive fatigue, and equity. She's a recipient of the IUH Values Grant for Spirituality for the year 2020 to 21 and will describe the experiences of minoritized and immigrant hospitalists. Thank you, Dr. Kara, for joining us today. Our second panelist is Dr. Brian Robinson. Dr. Robinson, a little way, there you go. Um, he's currently the director and section chief of hospital medicine at Eskenazi Hospital. He has been instrumental in the right range of hospital and, and administrative pursuits and improvements and transitions of care discharge coordination and operations. He currently is the chairman of the Medicine Use and Evaluation Committee and serves in many other hospital committees in his leadership role. Dr. Robinson received the IU Trustees Teaching Award as well in 2019. He completed internal medicine resident at IU School of Medicine and joined the faculty thereafter. Dr. Robinson went to medical school at Howard University in Washington, DC attended college at Northwestern University and was originally raised in suburban Detroit. He has that diverse background and a lifelong passion for inclusivity and diversity. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. And lastly, uh, we have Dr. Abdel Rahman, yay, um, who has been working with IUH since 2012. He currently is the medical director for the hospitalist group and inpatient medicine operations at IUH Adult Academic Health Center. Dr. Abdel Rahman uh, earned his medical degree from the University of Khartoum in Sudan. He completed his internal medicine residency through UPMC Pinnacle Health in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and he's board certified in internal medicine with focused practice in hospital medicine. So welcome everybody. So Dr. Kara, I'm going to just mute myself and let you begin. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? All right. Thanks for having um, all of us, Silk. It's great to be in such amazing company. And this is gonna be weird for me because others who have seen me present before know that I like to flail my arms about and it's good to see some familiar faces. So smile and nod so I, so I know that you're there. Oh, all right. Um, so I guess I might want to start just by clarifying what a hospitalist really is, um, because not everybody is from our division and it's a relatively new specialty. We are internal medicine or family medicine trained physicians who, care for patients when they're sick enough to be hospitalized. And so we have no outpatient presence. So we see patients at their sickest, we see families at their most stressed, um, and that's what we do. Um, we also are educators, scholars, um, and many of us are embedded in quality improvement and um, administrative duties. So we see a lot of good and we see some of the ugly at the same time. So I just wanted to explain what hospitalists are because my mother still asks me what I do uh, every few months. So just, just, just clarifying that. Um, I know this session is about discrimination in hospital medicine and we're all going to speak about our own experiences, but it is not truthful to the experience if we don't acknowledge the implicit bias that exists in medicine, um, perhaps the bias that we also propagate as hospitalists. So I did want to start our session by, by just acknowledging that and just talking to that for a few minutes before we head on. Um, so first of all, I think all of us in medicine went into medicine wanting to care for every single patient. So we, we might believe that we immune to implicit bias that we you know that's a problem other people have and there is no way that you and I would make snap judgments about patients based on stereotypes 
turns out that's not true. And there have been many, many studies and there was a meta-analysis smooshing all of them together. And there was 42 studies and almost every single one found that physicians, nurses, medical residents who were the population studied in those reports have implicit bias at exactly the same rates as the general population. Um, we, we might have them in different arenas. Uh, we might think about uh, obese patients being responsible for their own diabetes or responsible for causing their own, Ill, their own illness, but, but we have them too. Um, so we, we can't ignore that. Um, and then those build up in the system and sort of manifest in strange ways. And in the last two years, I think there've been two big studies that I think are important uh, for us to know about. And one was the evaluation of an algorithm that United Healthcare was using to determine how they would spend money um, to prevent readmissions. Uh, so essentially they were trying to identify who are my sick people who are going to need more resources to prevent them from coming back into the hospital? The problem was that they were using the amount of money that, that, that individuals had spent on their healthcare as a proxy for how sick they were. Um, unfortunately, Black patients were spending $1,500 less per equivalent illness. So they started out with the incorrect assumption, which was sort of diverting money towards white patients and taking it away from black patients who were, if anything, sicker than the white population that United Healthcare was serving. Um, so that's one example. Um, another study that came out last year, they studied all the patients that called 911 um, within a certain zip code. And within the same zip code, Black and Hispanic patients were taken to the safety net hospitals and white patients were taken to other hospitals. Um, so they were calling from the same place. And so there, there is something not quite right about that either. Um, and then within a hospital setting, there have been studies that show that having limited English proficiency increases your mortality by almost a third accounting for everything else. Um, so we, we know that there is a problem in the system that we need to address. Um, and we, we can't be great physicians and great, um, we, we just can't be great until we acknowledge that and do something about it. Um, so moving on, um, you know, we were going to talk about our own experiences and I am an immigrant physician. Um, you know, as Sil said, I came from Pakistan. Um, and the statistic from 2018 is that one in every four licensed physician in the US is an international medical graduate. Um, that's a lot of us. Um, when you think about um, how many minority physicians we have or how many black physicians, 13% of the population in the US is black, but only 3% of full-time faculty in medical schools is black. Um, and currently IMGs are more likely to report poorer job satisfaction than their white colleagues and underrepresented minorities are far more likely to perceive not, not feeling included where, where they are. Um, so those are all statistics and these, I guess, lead into some personal anecdotes, which are going to be difficult to hear possibly. Um, so I guess I'll invoke Silk's uh, safe space um, reminder. Um, and I'll tell you that I thought maybe two weeks about which ones should I talk about and which ones uh, I shouldn't talk about because they just feel so ugly sometimes. Um, um, and I'd also like to say that I would not want to conflate or equate my experience with my black colleagues because, you know, at least I grew up somewhere where I was an equal. Um, so, so putting all of that out there first. So, so I came here in 2000. This was 
I keep, I got here about nine months before 9-11 happened. And, you know, there was all this pride um, and everybody from our university would tell us that, oh, you, you're going to be an ambassador for, for our university. You're going to be an ambassador for, for all people from Pakistan. And I felt such pride in that. And I felt such joy in taking on that role. And over the next 20 years, I have to tell you, it just becomes exhausting. Um, so I was an intern. I think this was my third or fourth month of um, rotation, rotating. And I didn't start here at IU. I started um, in St. Louis. And the rotation was um, an assisted living place for veterans where we would go and examine them. Uh, actually, it was an extended living for a facility. And we would sort of do the geriatric exam and take care of them right there. And you know, it was a drive away from usual campus. We went there, I went there, I used the restroom, I came out and there was a group of nurses there. And they started joking about, you'd better not go and use that bathroom after her. Um, you know, she's from that curry eating land and we'd better not be using that bathroom for some hours. And so flashback to 2000, um, 20 year younger me still in, oh, I'm the ambassador. And I, and I just felt outraged. And I was like, this is not right. They can't talk about me like this. This isn't right. So I go to the director of the rotation who is a white male physician. Um, I have to get an appointment and I'm like, I, I need to talk to you about something that happened and it made me feel really bad. Um, and First he laughed and then he said, this was not a big deal. You, you, you just don't understand that that's just humor. Um, and that was my initiation into the whole transformation from being this proud ambassador to be, oh my gosh, am I supposed to be ashamed of myself? Am I supposed to be changing myself? What, who, who am I in this? in this story. Um, and I think over the next 20 years, um, different versions of this have happened and um, it's been rough. Um, you know, I used to volunteer to work Christmas every year um, before we had kids. And uh, there was a lady who was not ready to be discharged. She was medically not ready to be discharged. She was still having fevers. We were waiting for her blood cultures to be identified. And I went to her and I said, I'm, you know, this was Christmas day. I was like, I'm really sorry you're still in the hospital. And she looked at me and she said, why would you be sorry? Your kind doesn't get it. And I was like, okay. And, you know, so that was another big moment. And I'm like, okay, I guess I have to be as innocuous and not invoke spirituality. And um, I, I can't, I can't, I can't be recognized as one of them. Um, so, yeah, I think um, if part of what Silk was wanting was for us to say something, um, provide some sort of recommendations to people. And I would say as individual physicians, each of us need to stop using stigmatizing language in the notes we write. So if, if we um, are going to describe somebody who is requiring pain medications or whatever, don't say, oh, drug seeking behavior, say opioid use disorder because words matter. And there has been a study that says, that showed that if you showed the same medical information, but said in two different ways, the way um, your trainees manage the patient's pain mattered and changed. So that's our, on us as an individual responsibility to our patients. We can do something about that. Um, I would say to all of us, we went through a lot and lot of school um, and we need to value our own expertise. Um, we know a lot and I don't think we should wait for somebody else to come and be uh, be the solution because I think we need to find it ourselves because we are experts, we are pretty smart um, and we can do this. And 
hospitalists specifically, or educators, researchers, we, we can fix it in many, many ways. Um, I think for those of us who are in quality improvement and administration, we need to start asking for racial breakdowns for both our own demographic and for any outcome that you are trying to improve. Because, you know, we value what we measure and we measure what we value. So we, we need to start asking for that information. Um, I think for the institutions, it's been great to see um, the voices of support, um, but I think we need to see the budget of support and we need to see resources sort of towards that support. Um, and I think for my colleagues, I'd say, um, listen to us and believe us when we are telling you these stories, because this, this is an everyday reality and nobody else is going to be surprised by these stories. Um, and then in my last minute, I'd like to say, I'm actually optimistic right now. And I'd like to say why I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because there's 79 people listening to really uncomfortable stuff right now. So that makes me happy. Um, I, you know, we, we, we've all seen the protests and we saw an enormous turnout for the white coats for, Mar for, for Black Lives on campus a few weeks ago. That gives me optimism. Um, a few of my mentors are all, I can see them in the front row. There's Dr. Suter, there's Dr. Franco, um, Dr. Sachs, Dr. Weiner, Dr. Kronke. They're all white and they all have beards and they're all old and they have, um, oh, sorry, okay. But they, these are people who are lifting me up. Uh, I see your beard there, Dr. Sachs. Um, and, and so they chose someone like me to, to lift up. And so that makes me optimistic. And I, I've been in the same job since 2003. And so I feel like I'm coming back full circle into a place where I feel safe. Everybody who works with me, my, my colleagues know me, and I don't feel the constant need to prove myself. And I can say the things I want to so I have, I now have a safe space. So anybody starting on this journey, you'll get there uh, like I have. Um, and finally, I'm optimistic because my kid took me to a K-pop concert last spring and there was, well, that is Korean pop for those of you who don't know, there was an auditorium that's like 10,000 people were singing Korean songs in, in Korean. Um, and not, very few of them were Asian. So I think this next generation is going to be completely different and I think things are going to get better. Um, and I'm going to hand it over back to Silk now <laughs> and stop talking. <laughs> we'll come back to you, Dr. Kara. Um, I especially um, appreciate the stories that you shared. Um, but also you care, you um, calling out all those old men. <laughs> I, I, noticed, I noticed a few rolls in their eyes, you know, when you say, you, when you pointed out how old they were. As a group, if we would have been together, we would have said something. <laughs> no. um, I will now um, invite Dr. Brian Robinson to share his piece. Okay, oh, everybody see me? You disappeared on a there you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi, how's everybody doing? Thank you for joining and thanks for this opportunity to to address um, you know these delicate topics. So many things that can be said. I think I'll just start with wow, like you know, growing up, um, it's still interesting that we're still having to have these conversations and address um, these issues, um, but I'm glad um, to be in the position we're in in hospital medicine and to be able to talk about some of these things. Um, obviously, a lot's happening in the world, and I think I wanted to first just start with some, you know, definitions, because there's this concept of systemic racism and systemic bias. You know, what does that mean? Where does it come from? You know, the bias is 
often just roots that we're that have that were ingrained in us at some point in time. Um, often, most people that have biases aren't racist or don't identify as being racist at all. It's people that just keep doing um, things as they've always been done. They just keep with the status quo and um, are just doing what they're used to. As an example, in hospital medicine, there's things that we do for no reason, right? This is something that's been pioneered in hospitalist literature. Things like doing daily labs on patients, uh, doing guaiac stool testing, writing non-contributory in your family history when you write an h &P. Where do we learn these things? Where did they come from? Can anybody say specifically when, where, and who taught them any aspects that we learned? You probably can't. You saw somebody do it, you read it somewhere, you develop habits. Well, these same things happen with anybody in society. Um, people get influences, of course, from their families, from their churches, their communities, their schools, and of course, you know, the media. The media has been a massive source um, long term of of um, you know putting out stereotypes of, of people and ultimately it's brainwashing if you turn on any news channel today and it doesn't matter which uh, way you lean politically i don't care which one you turn on you're going to be brainwashed by hearing the same things over and over and over and that creates your normal and that creates what's acceptable and not acceptable and and what's what's right to you so in the hospital setting as, as ariba mentioned you have this melting pot of people. You have all doctors, nurses, therapists from different backgrounds. You have patients from different backgrounds interacting um, in a way that, that is somewhat unique. And sometimes these biases can, can flare, flare their heads, unfortunately. Um, so for me, um, I'm from Michigan. Um, so I was, I was raised in a relatively diverse area, but experienced racism and saw racism occurring to other people at different points in time. Both of my parents are from the Deep South, from Louisiana and Alabama, and experienced even more of it. So as I grew up, you also kind of become that same ambassador-like person to try to, to um, uh, represent yourself in a positive way and, and do the best you can. Um, for African American people, we always say that you know you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. Um, sometimes that's the case, sometimes not. Um, it's great to have this campus that has a wonderful leadership and, um, and and mentorship as well that we can that we can lean on. Um, as far as experiences in the hospital, I mean, I've I've been here now for almost twenty years as well, and. You see, you see a wide variety of things that stem from um, uh, coworkers, learners, and a lot of it, again, is bias. Back to definitions. A lot of people are biased, and in America, it's almost impossible not to have biases about something. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, what's something that I'm very biased about? I think I'm biased about wild bears. Why? because I see wild bears on television and they look mean and, and angry and can kill me. So if I saw one in the wild, my bias is gonna kick in and like that animal's dangerous, right? That's expected. But we have more biases that don't make any sense. We have all these influences that may, um, may create um, a, a bias um, in people that we may not even know. Um, so for example, I know some of our foreign colleagues, um, I think it's, it's, it's funny sometimes when we have patients that sometimes question one of our foreign colleagues and they say, well, I couldn't really understand that person. And I say, well, actually that person, although they are of a different descent, that person was born and raised in America and speaks perfect English. But as soon as they saw them, the bias came up that they couldn't understand them, although there's no problem at all, right? I've had interesting encounters with many patients in, in many different ways. I think some of the more interesting examples actually turned out positive. Sometimes I get patients that have very visible and obvious um, racist tattoos. You go to examine somebody, you lift up their shirt and being in the, um, where I was raised and everything, I had to be very conscious of some of the terminology, some of the code words 
for racism and even for white supremacy. So when you see somebody with an 88 tattoo, that's like a white racist tattoo. It stands for HH, which means Hail Hitler, right? If you see WP, that means white pride or white power, you know, and then the symbols and everything. So sometimes I'll say to patients, hey, that's a pretty interesting tattoo you got there. <laughs> and they'll look back and they'll go, oh, and they'll often, you know, try to cover it up, but almost like an embarrassment. So luckily, many of them had a past and have hopefully repented in some way. Um, I've never been asked to um, come off of a case by a patient, luckily. Um, and I, again, take my ambassadorism and try to take care of the best people as, as best that we can. I think that's one way that we kind of, of combat the bias to say that, you know what, more people um, of my background and my race are more like me than anything else. Um, and, you know, what you've been told is just not necessarily the truth, right? Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I guess something that's a little more humorous, I was just looking at other things to say, and of all people and places, the movie Austin Powers, if you don't remember it, um, one of the movies, there's a quote that, that he says that's kind of tongue in cheek. He says, there are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's culture and the Dutch. <laughs> so, so he um, obviously is a non-racist person that wants to be embracing, but for some reason he has this odd uh, um, fear of the Dutch. And of course, most of us probably don't know anybody Dutch or even can think of a stereotype, which was kind of what made it what made it humorous. Um, but we li we live in an interesting place. We we live a uh, we have a great campus, I believe. Um, I know where we work now is specifically looking at racial disparities and actually our organization went through and asked every department to just give us a list of perceived racial disparities so we can address them. Because you have to keep in mind that systemic racism often stems from a long uh, period of time of people just doing what they always do. Like the education, the public education system in America you have the education department and they make, they create what everybody learns. And it's from a very, very European perspective. You know, they leave out all kinds of things because the government doesn't want them to teach you or the government uh, has, has told them not to. And as time goes on, more people who are not racist take over but continue to do the same thing. So it's very easy to have systemic racism and systemic bias in any system without having racist people. And I think that's one message that I really wanted to, to get across and um, see if we can shed a little bit of light on. And I think I'll, I'll end. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Again, we'll, we'll come up, come back to our panelists. Dr. Abdel Herman. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Suda. Can you guys hear me well? All right, so uh, thank you so much for um, giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, join this uh, talk with you all. Um, and thanks for the Department of Medicine uh, getting this arranged. Um, I think like Ariba and uh, Brian were saying, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to look to things uh, forward and how can we, um, you know, get better in this. And, um, you know, as we've been through, you know, those difficult times with the COVID, the biggest thing I learned is um, how we are all in this together. And I think this is another opportunity. It's not um, just us who've been through this process or um, whoever is minorities. Um, I think everybody else have a role in this. Um, even uh, those who believe there is an aware, uh, who are aware and recognize this, have their own role trying to help and move things uh, better um, in multiple aspects. So I think it's um, a great opportunity for all, all of us to be uh, in this again together. Um, you know, as Ariba says, and I'll uh, mention a couple of things, we as a hospitalist, and she put a good definition, and I like the way that uh, she tried to define our specialty. We are the denim or more of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, quarterback, okay, for the patient care in the inpatient. So we, um, we are in the middle of a lot of um, high dynamic, uh, you know, with uh, patient uh, care involving subspecialists, uh, trying to coordinate multidisciplinary approach for those patients. Um, so we get most of the interaction either directly with patients or even with the specialist 
and other uh, discipline. So this is uh, our role. This is our life that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, I've also seen, you know, and considered when patient comes to the hospital, any individual, you know, when they get sick and they're in the hospital, they are at their, at their weakest point of their life, you know, and, and, and sometimes we, um, um, I, I kind of look into this, and especially if we're talking about the, um, uh, where we fall, fall in a bias, okay, uh, sometimes we try to understand the patient and maybe, you know, feel their, this is their weakest point, so trying to um, look at them and make sure that we are treating them with fairness um, and be fair with them it, um, can get challenged. And especially when I look at our, um, you know, as Reeve and Brian maybe mentioned it, our, um, you know, patient who are, um, you know, are needing uh, more of care in like pain management, okay? Um, sometimes we um, don't look into it as more of, um, you know, I would label them as, as pain seeker, but they are in their weakest point of their life and that's why they are seeking our help, you know, and sometimes trying to realize this fact is a little bit, uh, we get distracted with all the work that we do. Uh, in terms of my experience, you know, with patients, you know, maybe it uh, hit me once and this is one of the things that I kind of remember all the time, uh, dealing with a patient when I was walking to their room and trying to deliver the care that I usually do. Um, you know, I've been asked by the patient, um, you know, immediately, you know, just, I need you to leave the room. And I was kind of surprised, you know, have I done anything wrong? What, what, what have I done for the patient to ask me from the first counter, you know, and it didn't hit me exactly what was going on. And then uh, when I say and ask him, you know, there's anything I can help with or what, what's going on. And then, you know, and then he pointed, you know, to me with uh, my name and, you know, you've been uh, more of an um, Arab and Muslim. So it's more of a more cultural, religious uh, kind of interaction for me, which is, you know, being man of a color and from a different culture and, you know, religious was challenging. Um, and at that moment, I just, you know, took a few seconds trying to think. And my biggest thing is, you know, what can I do for that patient? You know, where, where I'm going to go, you know, um, who's going to take care of that patient? You know, the patient needs to uh, continue his medical care. And um, that comes from me not knowing what's the procedure when this happened, you know, what, what, who, who do I go to, you know, what's going to be the next step. Um, you, know, thank, you know, thankfully, the nurse was uh, with me in the room at that moment. And I, um, you know, we did have a good team support and she recognized that, you know, there's something that needs to be happened. So she just pulled me out of the room immediately, you know, and, you know, said we'll address this. Um, they had to go back and talk to the patient. And I think, you know, even the social worker was involved. Uh, it was a moment that the patient was maybe more stressed. That's why he ended up and he ended up apologizing. And I personally continued the care of that patient afterwards. But uh, really what hits me is, you know, uh, the things that I should have been reacting, you know, should I even, you know, afterwards, I continued the care of that patient and I delivered my, you know, uh, mission to them, me being a physician uh, during their hospital course. But should I think about uh, taking myself away from that case? Um, you know, it was more of a challenging afterward thinking about it. And in my mind, I would have done the same and continue the care of that patient, you know, trying to uh, address them, um, you know, address their clinical needs uh, reg in regard of their uh, thought or whatever they think about me. Um, it's something that I try to do always and deliver. Um, and then the other thing is I thought about is what we have in our group or what, what is it within our organization that we try to support if such action happen. You know, we, we kind of practice and we have kind of all overall guidelines practicing to support each other. And I'm sure if I went back to my director at that time or, or, or even if I asked my colleague, um, you know, uh, to take over the care of that patient or try to help me with it, uh, even if I feel the stress, they would not hesitate, you know, to help me with that. But I don't think we have, you know, clear guidelines or, you know, to my knowledge, and I know there's a lot being worked on as an organization, and I'm looking forward to um, hear about this, uh, but we don't have any, you know, um, uh, guidelines how to approach this exactly. And even within our group, most of it comes into, um, you know, teaching us or, you know, having coaching us to go through this process. Um, you know, we, we maybe this is the first time I'm engaged in such a discussion, but I think this is very important, even just to be aware of there is an, an issue, or there is something that we need to talk all together about it is very helpful, helpful for everybody else um, to go through this process. And even if you 
had to be in a situation uh, with a patient or with a colleague, at least um, learning how to move forward or how to um, seek help or how to, you know, there is support that is uh, really designed for such situations. I think it will be very uh, helpful for everyone. Um, so, so the, um, the thing, the support I got in that case uh, was very um, helpful uh, from the team members, uh, but I was wondering if there's how, how much more as an organization will be there and how much um, uh, would be there to help with such um, um, situation. Um, I, I come from a uh, multicultural and I can tell you this is not just a, uh, not in US, I've been facing this even in Sudan. Uh, there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, cultural things that you feel maybe some discrimination in it and other cult where I grow up and, um, and to Brian point too, I was born in US, so I, I'm, I'm uh, US born, uh, but um, you know, from a background of Sudan, I've been raised in multiple countries. So even cultural changes or how to deal with different culture is um, a challenge that I, I've seen uh, through my life, you know, um, and, and just sometimes you don't recognize this of people sometimes might behave in a way they don't feel they are uh, discriminating, but um, it is when you are on the other side, um, you, you can see it. And, and sometimes speaking up is a little bit of a challenge. You know, sometimes, um, you know, when you try to talk to the other person um, from a pressure point, um, it is challenging. You, it comes in your mind, but when that situation comes in, it's kind of hard to deal with. So um, I think uh, one of the things is I, I look for, like um, Ariva is saying, is um, I truly um, look into more uh, what's going to come, um, you know, and if, if there is a lot of organizational maybe support for this and how much can be putting into a policies to help us all through this uh, to really, you know, illustrate or how much of we are all in this together. So. Um, that's the two cents I have to say, and I get it back to you, Silk. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, thank you all of, thanks to all of you for um, sharing your story, your experiences, and your insights um, with us today. As I say, I really appreciate it. And um, certainly for those um, that are reliving any trauma throughout all your years um, and career, we especially thank you. Um, for sharing this um, very openly with this group. There are quite a few questions and I think I may go straight to you, Dr. Abdel Fahman, because you were um, talking about organizational leadership and, and policies and things of that nature. And one of the questions actually comes from Dr. Sox. Um, Greg, would you like to ask the question or would you like if I can unmute you, if you would like to, to ask that question. Sure. sure. Um, thank you. And thanks to all the speakers for, um, you know, for their, their talks and their willingness to engage in this conversation and for everything that they do every day. Um, my question, being an older white male, as uh, Ariba pointed out, um, <laughs> is that um, I'm eager to learn some specific things that we can do in the Department of Medicine, in the School of Medicine, and in our partner health systems that are action oriented. And I'm thinking, and it's similar to some of the lists that are out there from different groups about what white people can do to fight racism. So I want to hear from our panelists what I should be doing um, not only as an older white male, but someone in a, a leadership position uh, to help combat the things that they are calling out. So what, what are, in a sense, are the, the top 10 list of things that they'd like to see us doing, you know, as a department, for example. Um, and that could be about some of the experiences that they described, you know, around uh, you know, experiences with patients saying racist things to them or, or any other things they'd like to do. But if, you know, things that we could be working on that are action oriented, I'd love to hear their uh, suggestions. Hi, um, Brian and Emma, can I go first on this? Yeah, please. Uh, okay. Um, 
you know the 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 discrimination from patients is always unexpected and feels like crap and takes weeks and months to get over um but relative to this high stress of the situation we deal with i don't think that that's that that isn't what breaks you on a day to day basis it's the nurses rolling their eyes at you when you tell them what your name is or constantly um it's it's what's coming from from who you think are your colleagues and people that you're working alongside is is probably more frustrating so for an action item we don't even have a way to report this like what is it what do you even call it uh um wh- who am i supposed to go to to say you know i'm kind of tired of uh, people assuming that because my degree says mbbs in sterner that i don't have a medical license um i mean that's one concrete tangible thing just to let people know that you're at least paying attention to the fact that this happens um that's one thing i let brian and ahmed go next and come you can come back to me yeah I, i can continue from your point you know awareness okay i think that's the biggest thing is you know to engage people in any kind of discussion um and you'll probably get a lot of ideas when people start to get engaged in that uh, the other thing is you know although that we feel that uh, the problem is there we hear it okay when those situations comes in you'll be stunned and you're not able to do to know what to do exactly so i think i think you know uh, more of a uh a training sessions or learning session even for all of us okay to go through this you know and that comes again from Ariva say that you know it have to be supported about action items okay uh when this happen what should i do how do i report it how do i deal with it uh what kind of support is there for me okay to uh move forward okay with this and um <clears throat> you know as a physician i feel supported at that time when all these are in place uh you know when you go farther and try to you know change things more than that you know culture is going to be the biggest difficult thing to change but when you start addressing this and it's in place i think that will move the culture around you and you can you know change the mentality of the person who's you know arivas mentioning uh, even within your colleagues uh, point, pointing out to your degree um, as not a license one uh, that is not going to be an easy one to move but with the awareness with the engagement and trying to get people coach and learn about this even in the system uh, i think that's where it can start first um that that's the uh, thing i can come up with in my mind and brian can add more to it Well that was a, that was the perfect answer. I mean knowledge is power and more more education more um you know making making this uh more so on the forefront and letting people know that this is as important as knowing how to be a good practitioner and good in your in your field or whatever task is in the hospital it has to be filtered down to the other hospital staff and obviously we probably need to look for specific policies and things that either exist or need to be tweaked or what not um you know you look at all the uh, protesting and rioting going on of when you go on social media there's a lot of people that say they don't really understand like why are the people doing that why are they out there why don't they just go home why are they wrecking something you know rioting is like the the language of last resort that is the time to make the rope um so understanding the history that came all before the incidents that have happened which I'll I'll spare you cuz that'll take <laughs> hours to to go over um but uh, you know awareness knowledge and and support i think are the three keys and dr sacks i would love to see more white people more black people more gay people in leadership as my colleagues um i just i think we can hire a little differently Thank you all for sharing. Um I will follow up on that um Dr. Kara. Um Grayson O'Neill is um asking more about that <laughs> saying um what can white people not in obvious positions of leadership 
do to show support as allies without seeming like knights flying in to save the day and acting like we know what's best. For any of you there too. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, when someone comes to you with a story, please don't tell us how we should have acted different. Um, because believe, I, trust me, we've played that thing over in our mind 20 times over to try and come to a different um, outcome. Um, so that's, you know, that's just an everyday thing. Just, just, just be there to listen and believe us when we come to you. Um, that, that would be a good start. Um, but I think everybody can probably do something. Um, so I guess go vote, go educate yourself, uh, talk to us. It's, it's culture again, changing culture is difficult, takes a long time. And, uh, you know, the more that you're in the moment, the more that you continue to talk about it is, is the most helpful, I think. Um, recognizing those biases, you know, recognizing, uh, you know, the police beat somebody up and they're like, well, he must have done something. Well, sometimes they didn't really, they didn't really do anything. You know, the advent of the cell phone camera has clearly shown that. Obviously, we'll never have cell phone cameras looking around the hospital for, for hip, hipper reasons and being shared to see what really happens, although that'd be an interesting experiment. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, no, one's, no one has to be a hero or a knight in shining armor in these cases. I think um, the more you act, react, and influence what's around you, I think over time um, will be really, really fruitful. Um, I will, we still have a little bit of time here. Um, so I will take one more question, if it's okay with all of you. We had one just come in. Um, I will go ahead and, and read the whole thing. Um, this um, participant says, I happen to feel that the presence of armed police in our hospitals and other healthcare settings is a direct threat to our hospitalized patients. E.g., a black patient was shot and killed by a guard in Indiana maybe a week ago. Police presence also discourages patients from seeking care when they need it. E.g., the patient I care for um, with AKI requiring dialysis from bacterial endocarditis. What are your thoughts on reducing or eliminating the police presence in our healthcare setting? That was a pretty uh, hard question there. I don't know if um, Dr. Singha, I don't, I don't know if you would like to expand a little bit more on that. Or... Actually go first, because that actually came up with us at Eskenazi Hospital, we're the county hospital, and our security is the police. They are all Indianapolis police officers. Um, to their credit, I'll say they, they do a great job and they are very, very talented at the art of de-escalation, which is something that we want police in general to know. They recognize the sensitive situations that people are sick they're called to respond frequently for a variety of things in the hospital. We have, you know, the psych portion of our hospital that they often have to respond to in the, in the emergency room. Um, obviously, where the trauma center, people getting shot come. Um, I don't know that the patients see them as a threat necessarily, and it's often at our discretion when we call them or when we invoke them. They don't come unless we ask them to, um, although Sometimes seeing them walking around may put some people off. Um, some people may disagree with me, but I, as far as I know, we, we have a, a good relationship with them and I think they've been necessary. So what the alternative would be, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Brian. I mean, we're seeing the same thing, you know, our uh, security and when we started, they were not part of the, um, you know, the police department, but the AHC security and now the police department are doing a big role, like Brian was saying, managing all this, uh, aggressive behavior that we can see in the hospital, either from visitors or from patients or any kind of aggressive behavior around, that they do really manage very well because they're very trained to do, to do that, okay? Uh, it will be very challenging to see someone else doing that job, okay? 
but uh, I, I understand, you know, with all what's going on, okay, you know, it might create that question, but I feel they're needed to be there and they are serving that uh, help role for all of us. And I can't see um, how, how would those situations be managed by someone else. So I would agree with Brian. Yeah, I have a longer answer to that. Um, I feel like, you know, get needing police in the hospital was solving a, a problem of violence and guns in the community because we were we are worried that they're going to come in and, and shoot us. Um, and so we keep responding to problems with escalating Oh, if they have a gun, I'm going to have a bigger gun. If they're going to have a tank, I'm going to have a anti-tank missile or whatever. So perhaps as hospital systems and physicians and leaders, we need to go back and address the root causes. And so we need to go back and address violence in the streets. And um, I think hardly anybody else, uh, hardly any other country has police that is as armed as ours. And so that's a really big problem um, to solve. I'm not sure if I answered this question. <laughs> well, I, you certainly share your perspective. So that works too. Um, I know uh, Dr. Singh has said that they didn't have a um, microphone. Um, oh, but Dr. Sinha does say that you did a great job answering the question. Um, I want to acknowledge that it's 4.59 um, right now, and I want to give you um, as panelists an opportunity to, to just say the last few words. Maybe give us a charge. I, I just thank you so much. Yeah, I'll just say thank you so much for this opportunity. I would like it to continue and we can see more um, in the future uh, around this topic. Dr. Robinson. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for having this and having us. We really love the support and just the amount of awareness has happened um, in the world and knowing that, you know, actually, uh, I think I'll end with this. Will Smith put out a meme that basically said, racism is not new, but videotaping it is. So, you know, things things are new, but the more awareness people have and can be actively involved, I think is wonderful. And I hope the world will continue to change for the positive. Great. Dr. Kara? I think I'd like to reiterate that you know, if you want to get some optimism, ask an immigrant. Um, and it might seem like, and, and I am, you know, this is my adopted country and I will fight for it. And this is crazy times, but you don't know how lucky we are that we can have these conversations and you can, you can actually do something to make things better. Not every citizen has these rights. And so I actually think that this is all great and we need to just become very comfortable with having these uncomfortable conversations and it'll, it'll get better. Great, oh, great. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're all welcome. Thank you very much for joining us um, today. I want to um, announce that the next panel will be on July 15th from four to five again. Um, you will see that announcement um, probably next week, and it will be on racial disparities in infectious diseases. And we will have um, ID docs from IU, um, as well as Colorado and Nebraska joining us in, in speaking a little bit about these um, racial disparities in infectious diseases. I want to thank you all again for joining us today. And um, if you have any comments, feedback, questions, please do not hesitate to email me. Again, thank you to my panelists and, and thank you all for joining and taking the time. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>